Uh, today's community planning conversation is rather exciting. We are on location at the Straw Bale Home uh, here in our community. I won't say the location in case they don't want everybody driving by their home. And my conversation today is with Julie Vogel, who is one of the folks who lives here and instrumental in the building and design of this wonderful home, which is so quiet and so cozy on this terribly rainy, cloudy day that we're sitting here. Julie, thank you so much for welcoming us to, welcome. to your home. Well, um, glad to have you. This is a terrific place, and um, talk to us a little bit about uh, what straw bale construction is to help our viewers get an idea of it before we take our tour of your home. Sure. Um, straw bale construction has actually uh, been around for quite some time, uh, over 100 years, and it started here in the United States at the turn of the century in uh, Nebraska with the Kincaid Pioneers. And uh, the, the horse-powered baling machine had just been introduced and brought to the prairies out there. They were able to actually cut the sweetgrass prairie and bale it into bales. And, and because they were having a difficult time, there's no hardly any trees out there in the, in the plains of Nebraska. Uh, so they were having difficulty finding a way to build their own houses and lodgings. A lot of times they would cut the sod and make a sod house, but there was a problem with that because they were ruining their topsoil and oh, they were okay. ruining their prairie in order to have, to have their own their house and it wasn't very sustainable. When the horse-powered baling machine came along, they said, we've got this great like giant block. Why don't we just, you know, use, just use that? Because the prairie grass will grow back so it's sustainable. And they did and, and, and some of the structures that were built there at the turn of the century are still in existence today. I'm glad you mentioned that because not only are they in existence, they're actually historic uh, houses that are being preserved. So for those of you who are watching and thinking, how in the world can something be built with straw bale? They have lasted for 100, some up to 150 years. So it's a That's very right. sound manner of construction and That's sustainable right. that you talked about. Yes. What, um, how did you get led into this interest of uh, building something of sustainable materials? You know, it's been an interest of mine for a long time. And uh, of all the different types and forms of more ecological or more sustainable construction that a person could do, um, I was really drawn to straw bale construction because my dad is a farmer, my grandpas were farmers for five generations. My whole family, that's all we did was to farm. and so. Agriculture is very near and dear to my heart. And the plight of the American farmer is also near and dear to my heart. So uh, when I you know, became a carpenter and then subsequently started my own co company, it just seemed like the natural fusion of things. Plus, what, from what I saw, uh, it's, it, well, it sounded like a great idea. And then when I actually saw the, the houses, the beauty of them were, was just unparalleled to me. And so I said, well, that's it. Plus, you know, we have a lot of development going on around here. My company is mostly uh, a remodeling company. We don't do new construction. But we wanted to be able to offer something to the Champaign-Urbana area and to central Illinois as an alternative to just gigantic houses that were sprawling up everywhere that were very energy inefficient and not very sustainable. Let's um, um, talk just a little bit about your background. Um, you come from the visual arts, so yes. how did you morph from visual arts <laughs> to this incredible talent that you, you have yes. in um, <laughs> using uh, carpentry tools and knowing how to design and get things to fit, yes. um, which many of us envy tremendously. Well, it was, it was more a more linear path for me than for my business partner who majored in microbiology in college. Uh, that so, is a leap. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a bit of a leap. <laughs> a leap. But uh, for me, I took shop in high school, so I was familiar with drafting and I was familiar with uh, woodworking and using shop tools. That was all uh, quite familiar to me. And then when I came, I, I went to school, got a degree in uh, art education. I taught art first through eighth grade for three years and then came to graduate school fully expecting to go back to teaching when I was done. And I got my master's degree and 
just at that point decided that I really wanted a change, but didn't know what I was, you know, what I needed to do or what I wanted to do. But as it turned out, I was working for a professor of mine, and he was building an addition. And the people that he had working for him were an all-women construction company. And I thought, well, that's that's wonderful. I've always wanted to do something like that, you know, just for the. You've always wanted to do something, but you didn't know that you always wanted to do it until you saw somebody else doing it. So I bugged the owner of that company until she gave me a job, and that's pretty much how it worked out. Was that Marilee McDonald? It was actually Laura Weishar. Oh. Her name is Laura Weiskamp now. But, oh, okay. But at the time, her name was Laura Weishar, and she and Mary Lee and she had just, um, you know, they were just not at the point. That point, they weren't partners anymore. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So that's wonderful in our community. We have had several yes. all-women yes. construction uh, businesses, yeah. which is yeah. um, a, a first, and yes. not many communities can say that right. for themselves. And uh, well, the first job that I that when once uh, Jill, my, Jill Mulder, my partner, and I started our company, the very first job we did as a company was for Mary Lee. So we we owe a deep debt of gratitude to both Mary Lee and to Laura for everything that they did for us. Well, they laid a good groundwork. They certainly did. And for our viewers, you hear a child in the background. <laughs> that is Reuben. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All part of the the household here. That's uh, nice. They have that noise in the background. Um, before we start getting up and and looking at the house and talking about how you went about constructing it. Uh, for our viewers, how do they find out about this kind of construction, other than coming to you, obviously, but if they mm -hmm. want to do some reading or go to the internet to get right. some sources and get some background information? Right. There, um, there are a number of books out there nowadays uh, uh, that a person could uh, get and read. Um, that's probably a secondary source of information, in my opinion, because by the time a book is published, uh, the technology of straw bale is morphing so quickly. Oh, is it? Yes, really? that by okay. the time a book is published, they've usually found new and more up-to-date things that work better. But, but okay. to, to get a basic background, uh, there's a book called Serious Straw Bale. Um, there's all kinds, actually all kinds of books that somebody, if somebody just Googled straw bale construction books, I'm sure they would find a huge list of books that they could go to. Also, the, um, there's a publication called The Last Straw, um, and there's another publication called Out on Bail, and that comes like <laughs> monthly or quarterly or something like that. That You get more up-to-date information there because people are, are submitting articles and the turnaround time is a little quicker. The most, uh, the most up-to-date information you can get because it's almost like a dialogue is an online journal. Okay. So it's a straw bale construction online journal and it's international. So you get postings from uh, Mongolia, New Zealand, Australia, oh, like France, that. Scandinavia, Chile, Mexico, every, everywhere. Showing that this construction has a global perspective. Exactly. To it. And I know I have Googled uh, as I was learning a little bit about this. And you can find wonderful pictures of straw bale houses so people can see some of the examples that are around the the world of uh, houses that have been built and designed right, using right. straw bale. Can we start? Certainly. Certainly. All right. Hi, right, Julie, mm -hmm. um, would you please take us around the house and talk to us a bit about uh, what was entailed in constructing the house and then some of the things that you've learned along the way. You just referred to how quickly this is turning over in the sense of knowledge Base. I really didn't realize that. I, I guess right. I was thinking it was such an old form of construction, but obviously people are learning to what weatherproof it and some things like that. Right. So. And there, there are materials available as to, to us today that weren't available 100 years ago. And so when these materials are in, you know, uh, used, they have, it has implications. And sometimes the implications of a new material are not immediately apparent. And it takes five or ten years till you find out, you know. Okay. So, and, so talk to us about the lessons that well, you learned. Well, yes. In in this in this house, we did a modified post and beam house, uh, which means that we built a structure, a basic house structure, like a pavilion. If you went to the park and you saw a, a, a roof over posts with a truss kind of system where the picnic tables are, that's basically what this house is right here. All the bales then are set 
um, with the posts even with the outside of the wall. So the bales are notched with a chainsaw or whatever and then set into the wall as we go around here. We uh, had to, this is sort of a sculpted thing that we did with some stuffed straw and some chicken wire that's put into here. We like the sort of southwestern look of the, of the windows. So we did this, it did cause a few problems when we went to go and get window blinds because it's such a tight area that we had each window blind had to be custom made to the opening. So, and that costs more. So, if a person was, if I was going to do it again today, I might go from the end, uh, the end part of it first and find what would be a nice inexpensive window blind that I could use and then make sure my window openings would fit that. But it's created a wonderful window space and that sill. Oh yes, I should mention the sills because um, the, all the sills in the house are made out of wild cherry that my father uh, had cut out of a family timber that my great-great-grandfather uh, bought when he came to this country for the purpose of uh, milling lumber for his own farmstead. And uh, this, my dad had this uh, tree felled and he dried it out himself and had the lumber milled to, for use in this house. And so we, this is pretty special. You know, that, so is, that is very special, but also the wonderful depth oh, because yes, well, of the straw bales, which, yes, Ruben's, yes. <laughs> Ruben's <laughs> pacifier. Yes. Uh, the wonderful depth and the, the great light shadows that uh, are played against that. It's and that's something also, Patsy, that I should mention is that if you'll notice, all the windows are out to the very outside of the wall. In a warmer climate or in a dry climate, you might want to put the, the windows in the middle, okay. but because we have so much rain, driving rain, snow, sleet, we don't want any, we want a nice even vertical plane on, on the outside wall because we don't want any um, horizontal surfaces where water can sit and then penetrate into the bale. So that's why we want to have a nice flat even surface on the outside so all the windowsill, all the depth of the wall is shown to the inside. So this is one of the cautionary aspects of straw bale construction right. is making sure everything is tightly sealed. Yes, and also there are, you know, I would design differently for an Illinois climate, a central Illinois climate, than I would if I was building in the Sonoran Desert. Right. You, certain things you can do down there that you can't do here and vice versa. So you have to consider your own local climate, take that into account. Okay. And um, the flooring. Well, the flooring is reclaimed. Flooring has a story. Yes, it's, uh, the, it's reclaimed maple from the Sidale Grade School. A friend of mine uh, went there when he was a boy and when they were, they were tearing down the school and he just couldn't bear it uh, that they were tearing down the school. So they, he, he, he caught, talked me into taking the floor. <laughs> now, would you do this again? No, I would not do it again. <laughs> it was a lot of work to get it to this place and it was a lot of money to get it to here. But it's a beautiful floor it and is. I'm happy we have it. Is it because uh, sometimes the tiny grooves get damaged when they're pulled out or where it's Yes, damaged? and because there was about 100 years of gunk on, on the uh -huh. boards that we had, it turned out we had to clean them off by hand because um, Ooh, it was I the see. varnish that they used for like the gym floor or whatever was so hard that it actually ruined our carbide router bits when we tried to retool the boards. So we couldn't do it by machine, we had to do it by hand and so. It took a lot of extra work. Oh, those are things that are important to learn. But yes. the end result, uh, even though, uh, yes. as you're explaining to us, was a tremendous amount of work, mm -hmm. we have uh, a beautiful flowing floor space that it's just really nice ties the whole yes. area together so and there's nicely. there's little places here where the radiator, the old school radiators, burned holes on the wood. Or they didn't burn holes, but they burnt little places on the wood. Oh, yes. So one of my employees calls those zen spots, and she really likes them. Yeah, well, it's a character. That gives a personality. <laughs> it's, it's yes, yes. Yes. Than, uh, uh, the plasticized uh, wood that it, we're getting now from the, the stores. Right. There's more story to your kitchen counter and to yes. your fireplace. Yes, the, the, the pad that the fireplace sits on is a reclaimed chalkboard from an old grade school that the volunteers from the Preservation and Conservation Association salvaged, as is this. This was either a shower or a bathroom partition in a high school. It had about 10 coats of different colors of paint on it, which we, okay. which we stripped off, and this is, uh, you know, became then our um, island. 
it's cut a little bit, this piece of slate is cut a little differently. You can see the, actually see the sedimentations in the rock, in the stone. You can see some sedimentation here and here, and then all of this here. And then all of these countertops over here are, are old chalkboards. Not so. many people can tell those. The, the story is so, the, is this where you leave your list? We, and, we, we do drawings and write, drawings. write notes, yes. We have, enter, entertain. We, are, we keep chalk right here. You keep your chalk right yes. there. That's great. Yes. You can't get too attached to any drawing you make. It's really nice. <laughs> and uh, what, is there a story behind the cabinets in they're the just, kitchen? I think that they're just basic monarch cherry cabinets. And we got the cherry to sort of mimic the cherry on the windowsills. Okay. Um, one of the things I do want to say is that uh, vapor permeability is a reasonably important aspect with straw bale construction. And all, so we wanted a paint that is vapor permeable. So we made all the paints basically on the that are on the first floor. Um, and they, they're made from uh, wheat paste, uh, mica dust, clay, and colorants. And, and it, yes, please talk about depending that. Depending on the clay, uh, this particular paint, because it's a, we wanted a light color in here, it's a Ohio kaolin, which is a, basically a grayish white color. So you can add uh, retiol or yellow oxide or red iron oxide to, to the mica dust and the clay and the wheat paste that you've cooked and add water and you've got to paint. It, 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 the patina of this paint is so pleasant and much different than the paint we'll see yes. on your lower level, which is a commercial <clears throat> made paint. It's hard for people, um, unless they actually see it, to appreciate yeah, these differences. Right. Right. And there's a tremendous amount of wonderful artwork on the walls here. Uh, tell us a bit about the talent in the family. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jody and I are both uh, visual artists, and uh, Jody teaches at Lakeland College. Uh, and uh, these pieces here, um, I think, let's see, one, two, three of them are Jody's. One of them's mine. And then the big one that we just acquired on a trade was uh, one of Jody's former students oh. that she traded with. And now he's in graduate school at Southern Illinois University. Well, you, so we uh, feel very fortunate very to have that piece. have a student. And yes. Like, absolutely. He's, he's fabulous. And he really did you choose the color for these walls to enhance uh, pictures that would eventually get no. No. <laughs> no. Uh, what we had. You weren't the Ansel Adams where you were no. going for the the Ansel Adams white on your walls no, or something no. like that. We we needed a color that was fairly light because it was a great room and we were figuring that the ceiling would have to be the same color as the walls. Okay. So you know, yellow of all those things, yellow is the lightest color that's still a color and not kind of a pastel. Right. And we so we wanted something warm because and, and uh, <laughs> yeah, it's true. We wanted. <laughs> something warm. And we got we thought butter, the color of really ripe butter would be a good color. So that was the color we were sort of striving for. Here. And you have light coming in yeah, through have, your skylights right up there. We have some yeah, natural light coming in which is which is proves to be very important because we have very deep eaves. We have three foot eaves on the house to protect the bale walls. So okay. we don't have a lot of direct sunlight coming right. in. So this, this, the skylights have proved to be a really good idea. They're wonderful. Yeah. I can take you down this way. Oh, I, before we go, though, yeah. there's something I want to point out. Should and we talk uh, about, is your sink special? No, it's not. It's okay. a polar um, uh, deep sink. We try to have, we consider the kitchen the heart of our house. And so we try to have some kind of flow and energy and access to the heart of the house, easily from any part of the house. And one of the things we set up were these passageways to the different parts of the house from the kitchen. And this was totally accidental. It, it just happened this way. But as it turns out, if you're standing here in the kitchen and you look this way, you can see through the, pass, through the opening, through the second opening, and to the truth window, which is out in the foyer. So it just it just worked out by accident, but so we love it. It's a great line of sight. Yes, it's a great, great line, line of sight. Line. Right. Yes. And you will take us and show us the truth window. Absolutely, absolutely. We can go there now. As this is the truth window, which is a, a tradition of straw bale building, and it's um, the idea that you leave at least one part of the wall in your house open. You don't plaster it, so that that you can prove that this is an authentic straw bale house. And in this case. 
A uh, friend of ours, Karen Partlow, um, took a tin working class at Ghost Ranch in Abiquiu, New Mexico, and she made this, uh, the tin work and the glass door to go in this particular area. She took the measurements with her and came back with that as, as our present. It was, it was fabulous. <laughs> and why don't you quickly tell people Ghost Ranch is important because... Uh, George O'Keefe. Well, yes, George O'Keefe. It was, it was George O'Keefe's ranch. Home. That's right. It was her home. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. And still, the, her still home there is still there, actually, and you can correct. tour it and everything. Right. So yes, this is the this is the foyer area, and you can see this is the other side of the glass to pass through. We needed to put glass there to keep an airlock. These doors, all the doors here on the first floor, are reclaimed from Paca. This one particular. This particular one came from Harker Hall at the university. At the university, the that's right, at the University of Illinois. As we come down this way, we have a, our other bedroom, which is now Ruben's room. This is we kind of call our folk art room, also. And again, the paint is the, the paint is, is, is clay paint, wheat paste. It's a clay, what they call a clay paint, which is a water-based paint. We have a different clay body for this. And again with that nice muted patina mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. And let's see here. On the hallway here. And more of the reclaimed wood yes, on that's the right. floor here. This new post is also reclaimed from Paca. And then we've taken um, some reclaimed yellow pine and some new yellow pine to make the banister here. This is a... Uh, this is the bathroom, and I, I can, I should do it like this so that you can see the door. Oh, yes. This is also a door from Harker Hall. So if anybody needs to use the restroom, we just say go to room 218. And it, um, we're very fortunate to have uh, the Preservation and Conservation Association here in our community. We where they salvage have. these building materials, but that's not unusual. Other communities have similar. That's right. Provisions. It's nice. We just have a really a wealth of, of really great buildings, and the university itself is a is a real great storehouse of of architectural you know items yeah. that can be salvaged. Right, rather than into the landfill. That's right. And again, you use the same type of paint in here. Yes. Well, that wall that which is the straw wall is uh, clay paint. These now, because this is drywall and pl plaster over drywall, okay. um, we have latex paint in here simply because there's so much moisture, moisture. in here, and this makes it easier to clean. But that, but that wall definitely, and in my opinion, this is the only this is the only room where we have a very smooth texture. We have an open texture plaster everywhere else, but we we sealed up, we we troweled it smooth because just to make it easier to clean and more hygienic. And so the clay paint on that wall took totally differently than it did everywhere else. And it's almost as if the paint is, is a skin because you can see what the different repairs and patches and you know that type of thing that happened to the plaster underneath. And it, it ends up looking like green suede. So it does. It's kind of it's, wonderful it's good. patina. It's just, uh, I really love that wall. It's my favorite. And more of the uh, window sills that you yes, talked to us about. Yes, there's window sill too. That's correct. That's correct. Very nice. Um, also, I should point out that the jams and the stops for all of these doors were made out of old reclaimed baseboards oh. that we ripped down, planed ripped down, okay. and then milled the, milled the stop from the rest of the baseboard. So. Wow. That's so nice. And this is our, this is our laundry area, which we to, to save room with either bifold doors or bypass doors, we uh, we have bamboo screens instead. So you can see here, this is our laundry area. We mostly this stays up during the day and all times except for when we have company. So I guess you guys qualify as company. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so. <laughs> but that's good. You're showing that you uh, you have energy efficient washers and dryers. Yes, we do. There. We try to have we have new energy efficient appliances. Right. But this is this is I I like doing the laundry area because you can the the hallway then it has a purpose. It's it serves a dual function. Not only is it just a passageway from one area to another, but actually we stand out here, we can fold laundry, we you know, use this and so the laundry space can actually be half the size it would normally be. Exactly. 
plan. It's very well planned by doing it this way. So yeah, so. And you, uh, in our um, earlier conversation, you mentioned your company. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't you talk a little bit about that as we move down the hallway here? Sure. And the name of your company. Oh, sure. Our, our, the name of our company is New Prairie Construction. Uh, we've been in business since 1988. Uh, my business partner, Jill Mulder, and I started it basically because we couldn't get hired by anybody else and we needed a job. Um, and it's turned out to be a really good thing for us. Uh, we have a wonderful, fantastic crew of extremely skilled people who are also, they have their own career pursuits prior to this and they could be doing other things, but they choose to be in carpentry. So um, I feel very blessed and very lucky to have such a great group of people working for us. And um, we've, we're doing um, a big historical remodel project right now uh, of a Victorian uh, Italianate in near Seidel, Illinois. Oh. And so it's, it's been a fantastic... Oh, what an interesting challenge. Yes. It's been wonderful. It's been really wonderful. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. And here, this is a linen closet that we have here, and the doors here are also reclaimed, made out of old yellow pine baseboards. Wow. Well, uh, and these older woods have been so well dried as compared to today's wood. Yeah, they have a great patina on them. You know, this door also, these doors are also reclaimed, and, and the sort of um, patina that you get because of the age of the wood and the quality of the wood, because it's because of the age of these doors, are, it's all, you know it's all old growth yellow pine. Right, right. So the quality is just fabulous. It really, it really is. is. Yes, very nice. And we're in the master bedroom now, and we have a walk-in closet here, and even though it's a very cloudy day, I mean, you can see some dim light coming through there. Yeah, talk about what you did by cutting that hole. Yeah, we put a solar tube in here, and so it's got a little bubble on the top of the roof, and a tube, a reflective tube that goes down to here, and it reflects light so that during the day we can come in and get clothes. We don't have to turn the light on. We don't have to use the light. Plus, it's, because it's sealed at the bottom here, you have a, an air gap, which makes it more energy efficient than using a skylight. And it's oh, less expensive okay. to purchase, and not to purchase necessarily, because they're about the same amount of money, but they're definitely cheaper to install. Um, and then we also have a light inside the tube, mm -hmm. uh, an electric light, so at night or whatever when we need more right. light, we can right. turn that on. But that's a very um, unique way of uh, drawing some light into a dark space. Yes, because there's no, there's no windows or anything. And this is another bedroom that we have. Pretty much, you know, all the same sorts of things. Except I, did, I should mention too that the, in yes, the other room, shifted, and yes, we've shifted, we've flooring. shifted mid flooring materials. This is bamboo. Which is, uh, and it, it, we have a bamboo also in the other bedroom. And, uh, and you can see the knees yep. of the, the bamboo because right. of the way the bamboo was cut for this particular the, flooring. This uh, particular style of bamboo flooring is uh, a horizontal pattern, which you can see the knees very, very easily. If it's vertical, you can't see them so well. And the color is due to a process called carbonization, which it colors the, the bamboo all the way through. So if we were to sand this floor uh, and refinish it, it, we wouldn't need to stain it because it's, it already is that color. And it's really uh, one of the best ways, even though they do color bamboo now, that would be only a surface color is what you're, talk color. Right. you're talking about. Right. And the turnaround on bamboo is four to eight years. So unlike, you know, maple or oak or cherry, which is a lot, lot longer. And so. it's harder. And it's harder. And Although this one is because the carbonization does soften the bamboo a bit. So the natural bamboo actually is harder than oak, but the carboni carbonized bamboo is a little softer than oak. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. I didn't know that either. It took me a, yeah, I didn't know that. I always out. thought it was harder. Yes. So that's a good correction yes. there. Would you like to see the back porch? Yes, it okay. leads nicely into your back porch. <laughs> Oh, we're getting all some ice out here and everything. I don't know, would you like some more light out here? Okay. Well, this is our back porch, and we have a door from our bedroom to the back porch so that we can sort of live off the back porch in the summertime, and, and the great room's right here. Um, underneath that tarp out there is the cob oven. This uh, flooring here is made out of, it's called Trex, which is made out of 100% recycled wood and PVC.
And you want to talk about your nice studio space. Well, we have half of this building out here is our garage, and the other half is a studio space where, at some point, we hope to be more of the time than we are right now. <laughs> Something about having a seven-month-old is a, takes a lot. Takes a lot of time. It takes a lot. And um, well, we just finished a patio back right. here. Yes, the patio that you were telling that's, me about. That's, that's the other thing too, Patsy. A lot of people don't realize that um, having a patio like this, or any kind of, you know, not necessarily a natural stone patio, but any kind of patio is considered more sustainable than having a deck. So that's one of the reasons we put a patio in here instead of a deck, because it is a more sustainable uh, choice. There's the upkeep on it is not nearly as much. Plus, you don't have to worry about replacing the framing members or the decking boards or anything like that uh, in 10 or 15 or 20 years. I mean, it's, this, this will be that way for 50 or 60 or 70 years, and it's done. And you slip by the uh, cob oven. I know we can't see mm -hmm. it because you right. are protecting it due to the weather. Right. But uh, talk a bit about how you learned to build the cob oven. Yes, I went to uh, a workshop on natural plasters in Arizona and I learned how to, to make a, a substance they call cob, which is all, uh, basically sand, clay, and chopped straw. And you can make all kinds of things, including entire houses out of that. But uh, I decided that I wanted to make an oven. One of the workshop leaders w grew up on the Santa Clara Puebla in New Mexico, and she had a design for the, the ovens that they make, the hornos that they make in the Santa Clara Puebla. So I used that and another book that I had to make the oven in. It's, it's fabulous. It works and great. It, Tell folks how it works. Well, it works by, there's no flue on the oven. So it, it, the, it draws because of the ratio of the height of the oven door, the oven opening, to the height of the oven chamber. And you just build a fire, a very hot, fast fire, and keep feeding it for about three hours till the masonry is very hot, pull all the fire and the coals out, and then you're basically you're ready to bake. And you've cooked a turkey. 18-pound turkey, that's right. So Along with many other things. And it's right, but fabulous. it's the length of time it takes to cook oh, a turkey. Well, I cooked it in about an hour, an hour and a half. Oh. <laughs> so it does maintain its heat. Oh, yes. It? I think you're good to bake for about eight hours. Oh, man. You can bake. You want to start with the things that you want hot, hot. like if you were going to do pizzas. Since it's 700 degrees to start out with, do pizzas and maybe bake some bread then do a roast. Oh, I see. There's so, a real uh, there's a progression. A progression. Yeah, you have to be organized. More organized than I am. But. <laughs> this is a more utilitarian area of our house. Um, the mechanical room is right here. It's a very basic and plain mechanical room. It looks like most mechanical rooms in many people's houses with a regular hot water heater and a gas-forced air furnace, which I will have to tell you it hasn't turned on yet this year. Um, and I think it's because we just had a corn stove put in down here uh, last week, and of course I have my wood stove upstairs, and I, and I would be surprised if my gas furnace turns on this year. And that's something we haven't talked about. Approximately what is the R rating of your walls since right. you've used such thick straw bales? Um, upstairs it's probably around between R40 and R50, and the code here is R19. Um, and the, the, the roof itself we insulated with blown in cellulose, which is basically recycled ground up newspaper. And we put quite a bit in there. And I would imagine that the R value in the ceiling is very close to the R value in the walls. Down here, we use an insulated concrete form that's called Rostra, which is 85% recycled uh, styrofoam beadboard and 15% um, uh, concrete admixture. And then you pour, it's poured into, a, you do a slump pour that's a matrix, so you have a concrete, solid concrete grid that's rebar enforced with, um, with the uh, styrofoam stuff on the inside and outside. So you get about an R34 in these walls down here. And so those are all the below grade the walls. The below grade that's walls. the above grade that's, that's the straw. straw. Right? That's okay. correct. That's right. correct. Um, I can show you a couple of things here. We have a very utilitarian sort of bathroom, again with the reclaimed uh, countertops, reclaimed chalk countertops. Oh, okay. And um, we have a downstairs guest room. And as, as you uh, mentioned, Patsy, 
down here, we instead of doing a lot of plastering, all these walls, the exterior walls, are plastered. But all the rest of these walls are drywalled with no plaster on them, and all the paints are latex. Right, and so it gives a much different finish and variation of color, the multiples that right. occurs when you uh, use that other mixture. Right, you don't have as much. Right, that's correct. Yes. And then um, uh, to the down the hall here, here and to the right um, is our office, the office for New Prairie. We have a stained concrete floor here, which turned out to be a really good idea. It's a very inexpensive floor, and it turns out looking, I think, pretty nice. It's, uh, it's, it's wonderful. Not many people think about staining. No, they don't. And I'm not agreed. It's, it's surprised. This ends up looking a little bit like leather. It does. And then we have our uh, uh, corn stove from Alternative Heating Systems, and we're really liking our corn stove. And, and why did you choose that kind of stove for your basement? Well, we needed, we, we had, last, last year we heated it a lot with electricity, and just a space heater. It really wasn't, it wasn't very efficient, it wasn't very warm. <laughs> and we wanted something that was going to heat, you know, this whole area fairly easily and inexpensively. And corn is the, about the cheapest thing that you can use to heat with, at least around here. So we've been very pleased with this so far. I, I feel like when we keep the door open here, I feel like this ends up heating the upstairs. Oh, really? It yeah. draws up. Yeah, it was 74 degrees when you all came, and we, I, the, uh, the furnace isn't on. And I haven't, I haven't had a fire in my wood stove in days, weeks. So this must be heating the house up there, too. I don't know. Anyway, do you, uh, do you have general information of what it's cost to, to heat? a home built in this manner so people can appreciate right. Right. The, the energy savings? Yes, we, my business partner and I kept uh, utility bill comparisons, ther gas therms used last year. And this was before we had this stove and, be, and I really wasn't using the upstairs uh, uh, wood stove at all. Um, and she has a 1970s 2x4 uh, stud wall construction. It's a very nice house. Um, and I used 20 to 25 percent of the gas to heat my house per square foot that she did. So I was heating my house for you know one fifth to a quarter of what she was what she was using. Mm -hmm. So there is a significant difference. It's a huge difference. It's a bigger than I thought it was going to be because they had told us it was going to be one third to one half. So I did not expect it to be one fifth to a quarter. So. I was extremely pleased. It's, a, it's an amazing <clears throat> difference. Uh, I do see a piece of your foundation. Oh, yes. Yes, I'm glad you pointed that out. Maybe Nancy, you can Because I had sort of forgotten that. that. Yeah, this is, a, this is an actual piece of the rostra. You can see the rough piece. And the hole, the hole that goes down there, that fills with concrete. And these set directly on top of one another so that this comes up as a column of concrete. But also, you can see that this is scooped out. And then the other piece is scooped like this. So we have these round columns of concrete that are reinforced that make the structure of the foundation wall. And as you can see, that this is very toothy. And you basically spray this with water and just plaster or stucco right to it. It's a great substrate for plastering and stuccoing directly. So it adheres. Yes. A lot of insulated concrete forms you have to put, per add purlins and drywall or add purlins and uh, substrate and stucco or panel, this you can just go right on it, which is one of the things that we really liked about it. No extra anything, just go, you know. We so if you were going to build another straw bale house, what are some of the lessons that you, that you learned as would be the case? Uh, um, um, I think that I would uh, make sure to put a fresh air recovery system in my house because this house is so tight that, it, that we have you know, um, condensation problems on the windows and things like that, because it is so very tight. Another thing that I would probably do uh, um, is in this area of the country, I would use a lime plaster for the exterior instead of cement, which is what we use, cement. Because we use cement on the outside, we ended up using cement on the inside uh, for the scratch coat and then a lime plaster for the rest of the coats upstairs. If I were to do that over again, my bet, my 
in the perfect world, I would do lime plaster on the outside and earthen plasters on the inside. Mm -hmm. Make an incredibly breathable wall, plus the earthen plasters are so beautiful. You can use a color different them. color them a little bit right. and put little bits of chopped straw and right. burnish them to like a real leathery surface. It would be gorgeous. So I guess that's a couple of the things that I would do, for sure. <laughs> I think that's pretty important to do. Those are, those are very good clues, that, uh, that uh, things that you've learned. And if somebody wanted to build, uh, your house is quite large. Right. You have quite a few um, uh, square footage here. Right. Um, roughly what does this kind of construction cost? Well, you know, that's a good question. And, and I think what I had mentioned to you before probably isn't, I, I can't even remember what I said, but, but, but I was talking with my business partner after that, and I, and I don't think that I was correct. So I think, you know, typically what they've told us, I think probably is true, that you should expect to pay around 10%. If, if you said to me, Julie, I want you to build one, right. but I don't want to have anything to do with it. I want you to do everything, and, and when I want you to hand the keys over to me, and I'm just going to walk in. Right. Then you should figure that it's going to cost at least 10% more up front. But in that 10% more, then we're looking at savings down the down end the because we've just talked about what you're saving in energy today, and that's we right. know that's going to win since the house right. did not right. <laughs> pass the freeze. Right. So we, we, as of the 1st of January, we know that that's going to increase. Right. So right. there is always an upfront increase in costs in building right. something that is sustainable and right. more energy efficient. But in the long run, right. that gets made up. And what are you all estimating in three years, five years? Um, have you done any? What it, what it would pay for? Oh, making up that making tent, up the that difference. Tent, that difference. Have you all done any? No, you know we haven't. And for each house, depending on the decisions that you made about your heating and your cooling systems, right. that would be that would be a, it would be a different answer for everybody's house, depending on how much you want. If you wanted to go totally off grid, let's say, right. you'd have to put even more money up front, That's right? right? That's so, right. If you were doing with solar and wind, actually yes, now the exactly. advancements exactly. on wind. The other thing that I wanted to say, though, to Patsy, and I know we didn't really talk about this when um, the symposium came and did the tour, right. was that in using a lot of these materials that we're using, um, it really has a lot of health benefits for people who are extremely sensitive and have a lot of allergies yes. because we the the, the use of uh, Building products that have formaldehyde in them, which is a carcinogen, are, you know, it's minimized or if not eliminated. Um, using paints that have high VOC contents, which are problems for for respiratory. And VOC stands for um, vapor volatile volatile ox oxidizing, oxidizing ox compounds. Yeah, just so exactly. Folks know. Which which are problematic for right. breathing and also potentially carcinogenous. So there's a lot of other health benefits to just living in a space like this that are not existent when you go into uh, a regularly constructed house where every, all the standard things are used. Right, and the rule of thumb there is that outgassing of these VOCs that you were just mentioning is sometimes three to five to six years depending on carpeting, cupboards, et cetera. That's right. That's so right. it we, takes a long time. That's right. We have a very little, a very small amount of carpet in our house. And believe me, we could definitely tell the, the smell was pretty bad when we first put it in. It's really calmed down now. So you didn't use carpeting made from recycled pop bottles? No, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> we use, at this point, the basement, cheap. <laughs> cheap. cheap carpet. <laughs> no, no recycled pop bottles carpeting no, at that no. point. <laughs> well, no. I'm glad you brought that up and uh, about the healthfulness of this type of house and construction. And this type of construction isn't limited just to a house. It can be used in other oh, in other yes. formats. So absolutely taller buildings, bigger right. buildings and right. things like that. So it isn't totally limited. They actually make uh, multiple unit apartment buildings out of this rostra, multiple story houses. You can build an entire house with this. You don't have to just build um, you know a foundation. So so there's all, all, all kinds, kinds of, of potential and possibilities. Possibilities. Yes. Well, Julie and Jody and Ruben, thank you so much for letting us come and see your sustainable and green, very quiet, <laughs> wonderful home. Well, you're and, very welcome. And so quiet. Again, I want to mention that we are uh, 
next to a fairly busy street and we hear absolutely no noise and no sound from outside. So yes. that makes it even more pleasant. Yes, we Thank really you. Like that. And remember, planning matters.